You bet. <clears throat> it's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's tycoons. Good afternoon, tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm your host, Joe Rogan. No, sorry. I, I, I suddenly slipped into who I wanted to be <laughs> instead of who I actually am. I'm your host, Austin Peterson. My co-host, Landon Mance, as always, is here uh, with me from Vegas, and we are excited to have in studio or on the show with us today, Brian Bogert of the Brian Bogert Companies. Brian, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Yeah, we're uh, so we're all in separate locations. It's the COVID era. You know, we like to be in studio, and so I, I typically slip and say in studio. But um, we're we're glad to have you on the show. We know that you uh, went and did a speaking engagement over the weekend in Nashville, and for whatever reason, nobody was wearing masks, and so you decided the smart thing to do would be to quarantine, especially with some stuff going on with your family's immune systems and those sorts of things. And so we appreciate you being flexible and still making it on the show today. Yeah, likewise. I mean, I appreciate your guys' ability to pivot. I would have loved to be there in person, but, you know, we are in a virtual studio together. So happy to be here, brother. Amen. Well, uh, we typically start by has asking our guests to tell a little bit about themselves personally, right? So we know you've got a family. Tell us a little bit about that and kind of how you got started in what you do today and why you felt this. And, you know, give us kind of any history you want to give us about your past life uh, career-wise as well. Yeah, so... First and foremost, I'm a husband and father first, right? So I, I do have to say that I've got a beautiful wife and I'm forever indebted to her and the gift she gave me and our two children. Uh, wonderful boy, he turns seven soon and a, and a daughter who's five. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in integrating life and having an intentional aligned life that can be self-regulating. And it's because of those three that I have the ability to do all the stuff I do. So I have to start with that. Um, that said, I, I want to just ask everybody to indulge me for just one second. Unless you're driving, please close your eyes. Um, and, and I'll tell you when to open them in just a second. I want you to imagine going to a store, having a su su successful shopping trip, heading to your car. And while you're walking, you turn your head and see a truck barreling 40 miles an hour right at you with no time to react. Go ahead and open your eyes. That's where this portion of my story begins. My mom, my brother, and I went to our local Walmart. For those of you that are Phoenix natives, it was actually the one at Tatum and Bell. And as we were walking back to our car, I always had an excitement bigger for life. I wanted to get home and put that one inch paintbrush to use. But this was back in the days before we had key fobs. So I had to rely on my mom literally getting to the car, putting her key in the door and turning it so that I could get in and we could go. They were three, four feet behind me. And wh while we were there and while I was waiting, a truck pulled up in front of the, the store and a driver and middle passenger got out. Passenger all the way to the right felt the truck moving backwards. So he did what any one of us would do in that scenario. And he moved over to put his foot on the brake, but he instead hit the gas. Combination of shock and force threw him up onto the steering wheel, up onto the dashboard. And before you know it, he was catapulting 40 miles an hour across the parking lot right at us with no time to react. Now we were in an end spot. He went up and over the median, went up over the tree in the median, hit our car, knocked me over, ran over me diagonally, tore my spleen, left a tire track scar on my stomach and continued on to completely sever my left arm from my body. So there I am laying on the parking lot on a 115 degree day in the middle of August. My mom and brother watch the whole thing happen and they see my arm laying 10 feet away. Fortunately for me, my guardian angel was there as well. She walked out of the store right when this happened, saw the literal life and limb scenario and rushed immediately into action. So she came over, she stopped the bleeding on my arm and instructed some innocent bystanders to run inside, grab a cooler, fill it with ice and get my detached arm on ice within minutes. Had she not done one or both of those things, Landon and Austin, I either wouldn't be here with you today or I'd be here with you today with a cleaned up stump. And I know that a lot of people probably weren't expecting it to go there today. Like I realize I've got a pretty unique story, but what I've all also realized in all this time is that we all have unique stories. So what's important is that we pause and become aware of the lessons we can extract from those stories and then become intentional with how do we apply them in our lives. And we all have the ability to do that. 
And we all have the ability to tap into the collective wisdom of other people's stories to make sure that we can shorten our own curve to learning. So I'm gonna expedite the rest of this, but there's two, store, two, two primary lessons that I learned and it wraps into kind of what I'm doing today. The first is I learned not to get stuck by what had happened to me, but instead get moved by what I could do with it. And the second I didn't realize until far later, because many of those post-accident years, I was in a fog. I was being guided through the process. My parents, however, were not. They were intimately aware of the unceasing medical treatments, years of physical therapy, and all the things that were necessary ultimately to strengthen and heal me. The idea of seeing their son grow up without the use of his left arm was a source of great suffering for them. So they literally willed themselves day in and day out to do what was necessary, what was tough, to embrace the pain, again, to strengthen and heal me. So whether it was intentional or not, what they did was ingrain in me a philosophy and a way of living, which was to embrace pain, to avoid suffering. And I believe that when this is done right, that's also when people gain freedom. So it's this concept that I use to not only overcome this unique injury, but how my business partners and I scaled our last business to 15 million within the span of a decade. And now how I flipped that on its head as a human behavior and performance coach to help organizations and individuals, just like you, just like the people listening, become more aware, more intentional and who they already are, their most authentic selves. You see, I believe that's when the door starts to crack to perspective, motivation, and direction. And that's also when joy, freedom, and fulfillment can start to enter into our lives. And that's also when businesses can start to flourish, relationships can flourish, health can flourish. As long as the work is put in, people can accomplish all things and actually have a lot more than they think they're capable of. So that's why I'm on a mission to impact a billion lives in the next 25 years. Because I think if we can reduce the level of suffering on this planet, joy, freedom, and fulfillment can exist. That's where human connection can come back into play. And I think that we're going to have a lot better world as a result of it. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. And obviously that, that was not a story that I had heard before. And I, I think it's an inspiring story, but I have, to, I have to go back to one thing that you said, and you said, my guardian angel. So yeah, yeah. I have to know, was that a medical professional? Are you still in touch with this person? So uh, she was, I, I don't know if she was a nurse at the time or if she was a nurse in training, but she was a medical professional. Um, she did save my life. Uh, I, I have never spoken with her, but that's a phenomenal question because as of about two months ago, I'm on a mission right now to try to track her down because I'd love to reconnect with her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hopefully you have a name and, and can try to figure some things out there. But uh, I mean, you know, the, as well as anybody, the power of social media to be able to try to, to get that story out there and, and find her. Uh, that would be a phenomenal story. One that Joe Rogan might want on his podcast actually, but that's for another time. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I think that's a really cool story. So tell us a little bit more about the human behavior and coaching that you do now um, and, and what that means. I mean, I think people have an idea of what that means, but um, quite honestly, there are so many different types of coaches out there that I'm not yeah. sure that everybody's quite sure who does what and why specifically for our audience, business owners would want or need a human behavior and performance coach? Yeah. So most simplistically, you know, I call myself a human behavior and performance coach intentionally because I really genuinely believe that most things that keep us stuck are a combination of emotional triggers and behavioral patterns. So I'll unpack two things. I primarily work with entrepreneurs, business owners, high-performing salespeople or executives who don't know who they are or who are feeling stuck or stymied in their efforts to fill their potential. That doesn't mean they haven't reached a level of success. In fact, most of the ones that I work with have earned a level of success. They've established their business. They've earned multiple six figures, if not seven figures, and they're miserable, right? I did this, and I, what I see so often is that we start with the what. So many people start with the what. What house? What car? What amount of money? What amount of success? What spouse, right? And through the process of driving towards that level of success, they lose the who in the process, which is why they end up being miserable. And so many people then also start to think, well, if it's just a combination of strategy and tactics. If I pivot this, my business can grow more. I can get unstuck. If just then I can get there, then I will be happy and joyful. But that's not how it works, yeah. right? So I work with people to realign with who they are. And when we do that, it's through a combination of awareness and intentionality. Then the what becomes a manifestation of the who. Yeah. And what we end up doing then is then we can layer in strategy and tactics along their business because I've grown and scaled businesses. Strategy and tactics are necessary, but strategy and tactics layered on the wrong vehicle, meaning if you're not clear on who you are and where you're going, will only get you so far. And so that's how we unlock people to the next level. Yeah. 
I think it's a cool, cool way to look at it. I mean, the, the way that you say, you know, when I get this or when I achieved this, then I'll be happy. You know, it reminds me, you know, we, we talked a little bit before we came on, on the air that, you know, I've got kids that are 20 and 17 now. Yeah. And when I was raising them, I made the mistake of constantly saying, oh, it'll be so awesome when he or she yeah. is crawling, when he or she walks, when he or she can throw a baseball with me or, you know, all those sorts of things. I would say it'll be so awesome when. Yep. And now when people ask me for my advice as a parent, my advice is live in the now, understand yep. that what's going on now with raising your children and the same thing can be applied to your business, your family or your uh, you know, marital relationship or whatever it is. Living in the now is so important yet missed by so many people, including myself. You're, you're exactly right. And so I think it's really important for people to be where their feet are pay attention to what's right in front of them. But when I say get clear on who you are, it's, it's as much where you want to go. What are the things that are important to you? What are the things you want to accomplish? So I'm not one of those that says we only have to live in the now. We have to enjoy the journey or otherwise the destination never matters. So I 100% agree with you. But I also believe, look, we can have a future focus and objective perspective on where we want to go. I just told you I want to impact a billion lives over 25 years. Like that's not like saying, oh, I'm going to sacrifice everything else and not be able to have business success and have impact in the way that I want. It's just that I can calibrate and align my life in a way that it becomes self-regulating so that it complements each other. And the things that are most important to me can all be fed in the way that they need to be fed. People can have it all as long as they understand with clarity who they are and what they want to accomplish. But you also have to enjoy the journey. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, my kids, seven and five, it's gone by that fast. And I know I'm going to blink and they're going to be gone, you know? So to, to, to take the parent lens for a second, you know, one of the best pieces of advice somebody had given me a while back is think about your kids in terms of how many summers you have left with them. Cause it allows you to realize how finite your time really is. And we know that 90% of our time spent with our children happens before the age of 18. So that finite measure becomes really, really important, but it also allows you to realize that those small moments that compound over each other over the course of 18 years is what establishes a relationship. So think of the top number of summers we have left. Well, my son turned seven. I have 11 summers left with my son, right? Now that doesn't mean he won't be a part of my life, but I have 11 summers left to lay the foundation so that he wants to be a part of my life in the future. Translating this back to business, it's no different. It's those small things done consistently. It's about laying the foundation with absolute clarity and conviction on who you are, what impact you wanna have, where you want to go, and doing those things incrementally along the way, focusing on the process and the progress and the journey those things compound over time to be the destination. One of my favorite quotes ever is people are celebrated in public for what they've practiced in private for years. Yeah. There is no such thing as an overnight success. So for business owners, we have to recognize, yes, we need to know where we're going. Yes, we have to have a line of sight on that. Yes, we have to align in smaller incremental steps, strategy and tactics to get there. But if we don't enjoy the journey, if we aren't clear on who we are, then it doesn't really mean a whole lot at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. And, and here's the sad answer to your question for me. I have one summer. You have one one summer left. And it's, you know, it, I kick myself half the time because I, I'm, I'm actually a pretty easygoing person that most, you know, most people would think, you know, he's, he likes to have fun. He likes to make jokes. He's a sarcastic, you know, dry humored sense of, you know, dried sense of humor type of guy. Um, but for whatever reason with my kids, I just, I have such high expectations and I push them because I know what they're capable of. They are super smart, talented kids, right? Obviously I'm biased, right? Every parent thinks that. Yeah, we all but are. I want them to live up to their potential. But unfortunately, too often, I push too much to where they feel like I'm pushing them too much. Yeah. Right? And so now I'm literally staring down the barrel of, this is the last summer that my youngest will be with me she leaves in September to go away out of state for school. She'll be back, right? My 20 year old lives here right now. He was gone for two years to a foreign country. He's back now for one semester and then he's, he's moving out again, yeah. right? And so it, it's, we, you're right. It's such a finite time. I mean, to put that into perspective for you, when the Diamondbacks beat the New York Yankees in the World Series, my 20-year-old was sitting on my lap as an 18-month-old son. 
It doesn't feel chills. like it was that long ago that the Diamondbacks won the World Series, but that's how long ago it was. You just gave me chills. Yeah. So it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's probably the biggest struggle of my life um, is just being a dad versus being somebody that is pushing them to achieve everything that they can achieve. Right. And yeah. just, just loving them versus helping them be what they can be. Uh, it's probably the biggest struggle of my life. And I don't think you're alone in that. I think that's a thing that so many parents balance with balance and struggle with. Right. And, um, you know, I, I desire the same thing. I'm confident that I'm going to screw my kids up in a lot of ways, but I also want to show up and, and support who they are as authentically who they are and try to constantly allow them to turn into the things that make their heart happy. And also at the same time, giving them the tools to be successful, to reach whatever level of success or potential they desire for themselves while showing them the way, right? Um, but that's a really difficult balance. It's, it's difficult. You know, it's, it's in a lot of ways, it's, it's also no different than as a business leader working with your associates, right? Sometimes you're actually trying to push them, but you also have a belief in what they're capable of. And what I find is, is difficult for so many high performers, so many people that are successful is they hold the people in their lives to the standard they hold themselves to, not the standard that that person defines they want to be held to. Yeah. And that's a balance I struggle with with my kids because I go big in everything. I want to accomplish a lot. I want to do these things. Um, does, is that what they want? I don't know yet, right? It's too young to determine that. Um, and, and so we're just, we're, we're trying to do everything we can, but I understand that struggle. It's, my kids aren't 17 and 20, they're seven and five, but I'm going to be at 17 and 20 like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to make sure that I can learn from those that have come ahead of me and be super intentional along the way and just allow them to know that no matter what, they're going to have love and support. But if they also want it, I can walk along their, their side and actually help them accomplish whatever they want in life. Yeah. So I know Landon really wants to say something here. He keeps leaning forward. And I've, I've done enough of these episodes with him that I know he wants to jump in. But before he does, I have one more thing that I want to make sure that I get across. And, and this is um, something that I'll bet you have dealt with an awful lot in, in your consulting and coaching um, and maybe even something that you dealt with personally. And it's something that I deal with every single day in that I grew up extremely poor, like yeah. welfare from time to time, food stamps. You know, my dad was, he owned his own business, but he really wasn't a business owner, right? I mean, it was, yeah. he owned his own business to give he worked himself in his a own job. business. Yeah. 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 Gave himself a job, didn't make a whole lot of money at it. Taught me the importance of hard work and I'll, I'll never forget that. So I don't want to diminish the way that I, that I grew up, but because of the way that I grew up and what Landon and I do for a living now in helping business owners to build their businesses, exit them appropriately and build and sustain wealth. I suffer from imposter syndrome. I suffer from the fact that I feel every day, I don't belong here. Why am I the guy who's teaching these business owners how to do something that's so important, but I grew up extremely poor, right? And so that's, that's a big thing that I deal with. And so, you know, maybe you can address that at some point, uh, you know, during this, but it's just, yeah, I can hit that now, or we can let Landon jump in and come back to that. I'll let you guys decide. Cause I know he does look like he wants to jump in. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll follow whatever lead you want me to. No, yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely uh, do want to jump in, but I also don't want to, uh, you know, derail the, the line that we're on. So I would say, yeah, go, go ahead. And All right, share so I'm going to hit that piece hard. I'm going to hit that piece hard, Austin, because you are 100% accurate. When you said, do I experience this or do others that I work with experience this within the coaching capacity? What you just said, by the way, is exactly what I mean when I say it's not a combination of strategy and tactics, but an emotional trigger or behavioral pattern that keeps people stuck. Imposter syndrome is often a byproduct of shame, right? Shame is often connected to two different talk tracks. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. Or if you can shut that down and show, that, show up in the arena and do it, it's like, who do you think you are? So you just talked about, it. it's like, why would they be listening to me? Why would I show up and operate in this position? And those, whether you believe it or not, are limiting beliefs. They will keep you confined in that box, which is like, I can't go too big and I can't go too small, which is also something that prevents you from experiencing freedom and joy in a lot of the different capacities because you're constantly having to overcome that piece. 
So when we start to unplug that, we understand the root of that emotion, we unpack it, and we start to understand how does it manifest in your life? Where and how has it benefited you? Where and how has it held you back? And understanding how do those feelings and emotions actually bubble up? When you feel that imposter syndrome kick in, I'm sure you know what it feels like, right? Mm -hmm. Most people, when they feel those things, they just shove it back down, keep it contained, right? And they're like, well, I'm going to show up with a smile on my face and confidence and I'm going to move forward. Yeah. But again, that's only going to get you so far. The ability to actually unpack that, understand it, and know that in those moments when they, pop, when, when they bubble up, if you don't actually shove it back down, but instead you understand the root of it, how it impacts you and how to move through it, you can pause in those moments and choose a different path. Yeah. And the more you do that, it's like establishing a new habit. You start to break free of that cycle. Shame is something that impacted me deeply, right? And I didn't realize it for a long time because I told you it, there's two talk tracks. It's I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. That's where 90% of people fit. And although I've lived there in moments, I'd be lying if I said I didn't. The one that really impacted me was every time I did something major in my life, I felt the need to apologize for it. Who, who was I to be doing these big things? How come other people weren't able to do them? What, 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 right? Despite whatever my background was. And so that literally meant that I ratcheted back. I pulled back on the throttle in lots of ways that limited me in business, in philanthropy, in relationships. And so once I started to understand that, you never escape it, truthfully. You just don't. But you can have the impacts of it reduce incrementally over time, the more aware you are and the more intentional you are to move through it. So I don't know if that answered your question, but yes, this is a huge thing. Um, in fact, I'm working with a guy who's 68 years old. He's run multiple businesses. He's a consultant and a coach. He's had multiple coaches in his life. He's 68 years old, still investing in himself, right? And what we discovered in two sessions was that he had this deeply rooted self-worth issue that's impacted all of his relationships, his business success. It impacts how he prices for his clients. It impacts the way that they deliver services with his business partner. It literally impacts all these things. And he's got this fear of missing out and this fear of not actually accomplishing what he wants to. Well, yeah. once he started to unpack that worth, all of those conversations have now started to change. Because in those moments he can realize, okay, like when I'm hesitating, when I'm not moving forward with confidence and conviction, it's actually this you know, advocate in pursuit that's constantly chasing me, which is the self-worth thing telling me I'm not good enough to deserve the success that I'm capable of delivering. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm aware of it. It's something that I work on every day. I don't believe that it's held me back too much to this point, but there were a couple of points that you made that, you know, that are absolutely true in my situation. I mean, just, just the fact that I grew up the way that I grew up and you know, my, my siblings are, are successful in their own right, but at a different level than I'm successful. Yeah. Yep. And so you feel, you even feel that guilt there a little bit where, yeah. you know, they hear that you helped your parents with some financial things or, yep. you know, whatever. Um, it, it's, you know, it provides some, some guilt that you just don't want to have to deal with, but, but I'm working on it. I'm baggage, glad to know right? I'm not the only one. No. And uh, no, I'm telling you, this is actually extremely prevalent with high performers and very successful people. Yeah. Um, in fact, almost every single client that I work with, there is some emotional trigger and behavioral pattern that we end up discovering. And when we start to work through that, it frees them. Yeah. And so, no, I think this is unfortunately more common than, than I like to admit, but so far there's not a, a very high performer, successful person that I've met. That's totally got it dialed in. There's, I mean, there's a handful, but it's more common than not. So so Landon doesn't have it totally dialed in then? I don't know. He <laughs> might. I, I want to hear how robotic his voice gets right now. That might <laughs> Oh, man. Free well, the beast. Yeah. So a couple of things, Brian. Um, first of all, I love, uh, I was going to ask you about the, um, uh, the point that you made about impacting a billion lives. So I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. And uh, we, we don't know each other well. I think this is only our second conversation. Uh, but uh, I, I can assure you that you can uh, check off one more person because uh, uh, just by you sharing your your story and just the couple interactions that we've had, I can tell that uh, you will continue to impact my life and that you already have just from our thank very uh, short amount of interactions we've had. So uh, thank you for, for sharing that. One, one thing I was hoping just that you could speak to for a couple minutes, just to provide a little bit of context before we kind of jump into things and, and talk about how this all relates to business owners. Um, I, I didn't know that you had built and, and scaled a business prior to doing what you're doing now. Um, and I don't know how you got out of that. So could you talk to us for just a couple minutes about what that business was and how you built it up to where it was and then how you 
kind of transitioned out of it and how that led into what you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I always lead with, I didn't build it alone. It was my business partners and I that did it, right? It was a team of people. And then we had, ended up putting really smart people that were smarter than us around us. So I always start with that. It's not like I built this and it was all me. No, no, no. This was a complete team effort. Um, we were in risk management and play benefit consulting. Um, it was a series of LLCs. And so it, we, we fortunately did have a larger infrastructure that we could tap into resources and different things, but it was, I was a partner in this entity and we built it and scaled it. Um, so that was a 10 year run. Uh, I was 15 years in risk management and play benefit consulting, had some good opportunities before that. And, you know, I, I mean, literally in the early days, it was me and two associates. So I, I mean, when I joined, it was literally essentially no revenue, about a quarter million that had been established in a couple of years as it was starting to happen. I got to come in as a business partner um, and there was two of us and a quarter million dollars revenue. And 10 years later, we got it to 15 million and over 60 associates. Uh, about nine months after I joined, we brought in one other business partner and he and I went shoulder to shoulder for a couple of years. Then we brought in two others. That was kind of consistent for about four-ish more years. And then we started adding incrementally some different people once we had some, some size and some scale. So, you know, reality, but it's like any, any business, uh, although we had an infrastructure behind us in the early days, it was all hands on deck to do anything and everything. And uh, up to and including all the stuff that all of our teams ended up doing for us towards the end, I was in the weeds on because I needed to be, because that was as a business owner, what we had to do. So it was burning the candle at both ends. Um, but I ran that business for, for a long time um, and we had a lot of success. And we continued to grow double digits year over year. So I legitimately walked away from a lot. Uh, and the biggest reason is, is because I, it was about seven, six, seven years ago. It was actually right after my son. Um, first six months went by like that. And I realized that I missed the first six months with my son other than the first week of staying home. And it was the first time in my life that I didn't really feel like I had the intellect or solutions, nor did I have the people in my life to tap into from a, from a wisdom and experience standpoint to help me figure it all out and still continue to grow the business. So I hired my first coach. And that's kind of what led me into coaching because a month into working with him, he said, Brian, you need to be doing this. And I said, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like, pardon, I'll, I'll shorten it. But I said, F off, right? Like, here's the thing. Like, I'm, hiring, I'm paying you a lot of money, not to tell me how great I am, but to help me figure out these other things. Like, I don't need something else added to my plate. And he continued to trickle, continued to trickle. And it was about nine months after that, that, that the world sent me some pretty strong signals that he was right. So I had to answer the question, is this complimentary or conflicting to what I'm doing? I thought it was complimentary. So I jumped in with both feet. And so I ran both businesses side by side, but I had to cap my number of coaching clients. I had to cap my number of speaking engagements just simply because I had so much time, energy, money invested in this other world. I wasn't going to distract from that because I also had business partners and associates that were depending on me. Um, but the more I did this work, the more I wanted to do this work, the more I did this work, the more I realized that my wins were actually other people's wins. And there's a whole different level of fulfillment and joy that comes just from that alone, seeing other people break through, you know, ceilings, walls, whatever, and allowing them to experience financial success, relational success, health success, and start to see that this is a more common thing than I, than I really thought it was. You know, again, I was in a position where we were doing very well running in circles with people making a lot of money who were financially very successful running businesses. And a number of them were miserable, me included in a lot of ways. And so I started asking like, there's gotta be more to life than this. It was July of 2019, my wife and I had a weekend away uh, and physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, like it was one of those weekends that we were like just one unit. I mean, it was unreal. One of the best weekends we've had together in 14 years. And as we're heading back to pick up the kids, she leans over and says, how would you feel if you didn't have to go to the office on Monday? And I literally get chills every time I tell the story because I, I put myself right back in that moment. I was completely overwhelmed with fear, right? And she, I said, uh, baby, that's a pretty loaded question. <laughs> like, could you tell me some more? So she started to unpack it. And I, I had some other health stuff that impacted me a few years ago. I'm good now. But she said, I think you let this health thing allow fear to enter into your world in a way I've never seen you operate. She said, I think you've convinced yourself that we need the status, we need the size of this business, we need the financial security, we need all these things. And she said, I'm here to tell you, we don't. I don't care if we live in a cardboard box, what we need is 100% you. That hit me pretty hard. And then she went on to say, I also think you're dying a little bit inside every day that you spend in insurance. And she said, I don't think that you're even scratching the surface of your potential, nor are you having the impact on the world that I know you're capable of and I know you desire. So she basically said, look, I, I, there's nobody I'd rather put a bet on than you. We took a bet on you once, it paid off. Like, why don't we double down on that bet? 
and let's like double down and invest in the Brian Bogart stock. And I was like, okay, like interesting. So she gave me the push and the permission. I unpacked that over the course of three months and I had to, right. I had to do, I did a seven year cash flow analysis. I really needed to understand like what this looked like with my own reserves and my, my buy sell and what would all this look like? Could I create a runway to actually build something from essentially the ground up? Cause although I had clients, it wasn't of scale at the level that I'm going to go impact a billion lives out of the gate. Right. I mean, it's, I needed to really think through that. And it was September, 2019 that I made the decision I'm doing it. So I communicated to my CEO and my business partners. And I said, this is the plan by the end of this fiscal year, I'm, I'm out, I'm going to execute my buy sell. And that 10 months I was working more than I'm even proud to admit, but it's because I wanted to leave on the standards in my business that I set for myself. And I wanted to be able to lay the foundation in what we were doing. So it was about hundred hour weeks for the course of about 10 months. Um, definitely sacrifice some time with family for the sake of doing this, which is not something that is sustainable nor desired nor recommended, but it was my wife and I agreed this was a period of time. Um, and then it was May of 2020 that I went in uh, with both feet. And it's been an absolute blessing, by the way. Uh, it's unreal what's happened because it's only further enhanced my belief on really aligning with who you are. Because I was only 95% there when I was in that other business because I was representing other people, other associates, other business partners and other brands that I had to be really cognizant of filtering who I was to make sure that I supported that. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing bad. It's just, it's the truth. I'm forever indebted for the opportunity to build this business. But that gap between 95% holistically me and where I'm at today, I feel more joy. I feel more free. I feel more fulfilled and I feel more like who I am than I have in my entire life. And it just so happens that it's that and me showing up as 100% who I am that has now led to unbelievable business growth over the course of these last nine months. We've now established two different organizations and entities with business partners across the world that have happened as a result of all of these things. And now I'm just going all in, uh, which I already was, but it's, I'm all in on my philosophy now, which is, okay, this is what this looks like. And everybody deserves to feel like I feel right now. Yeah, that's great, man. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, breaking through the, the ceiling or something like that. And you've talked about being intentional, which uh, is extremely relevant to uh, my own life and my practice because my practice coordinator, uh, Christina and I, when we did our strategic business planning back in November, December, we identified our theme for 2021, which is intentionality I love uh, it. In, in all aspects of, of how we run and, and operate my practice. So I, I, I love that you, that you mentioned that. I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But before we do, maybe we kind of lay, lay the groundwork uh, and you can talk about, you know, what are, what are some of the hurdles that small business owners uh, face in terms of, of growth and, and development and getting to this, this point that we've kind of alluded to a couple of times in our conversation so far? Yeah. So I think first and foremost, uh, I love that your theme is intentional, by the way. Um, but what we are unaware of, we can't be intentional with. So I think that one of the big things I see, and this is true for business owners, small business owners to begin to scale, but also just in general in life, there is a giant lack of awareness in the way that people operate. There was a longitudinal study actually done in businesses, and I'm going to butcher this, but it's directionally accurate. Um, there were 72 companies that ranged in size from a half million to 5 billion in, in size, different industries, different business segments and everything. And what they ultimately came back to is that the single greatest predictor for success was if the business owner and leaders within the business had a high level of self-awareness. So what we're unaware of, we can't be intentional with. And so when we talk about awareness and how does this impact us, right? Do we feel the need to be the guy or the gal that does everything, right? A lot of business owners get stuck because they don't know how to leverage and scale their businesses. Because for whatever reason, they feel they need to constantly show up and justify to their clients that, that I'm the one who can get it all done, right? There's like an ego play in some ways, but it's also like trying to justify and often backfilling or numbing some deeper rooted emotional trigger, right? Like that, that they can't let go of things, a control freak, uh, whatever that might look like. And so one of the biggest things for small businesses in particular is they don't understand how to leverage and scale. So one of the things, and this will just be a, a piece of advice for a lot of people, Regardless of what state you're in, regardless of where you're at from a financial perspective or ability to add team members, ask the question and run it through these filters. There's three questions I ask before I do anything. That doesn't mean I don't do it, 
but, but I always ask these questions. Is this something that only I can do? Is this something that someone else can do? Is it something that even needs to be done? Most people keep themselves busy and do a whole lot of things. Many things that someone else can do or don't even need to be done, or they haven't gone to the level of awareness to understand what are the things that only they can do, right? As a business owner, I know there are certain things I can't train or teach someone else to do. If I'm gonna be the face of the business, if I'm gonna grow it, I have a unique set of skills. I have gifts that I've been given that only I can do. But about 90% of what's required to be done in the business can be done by other people. So where and how do I make myself uncomfortable? How do I embrace the pain of investing the dollars sometimes even before I feel comfortable doing so in hiring somebody to avoid the suffering of being stuck with stagnant growth because I can't get leverage and scale in my business. So I think in small businesses, there's a whole lot of different directions I could take this answer. But I think that that's one of the most common trends is people just don't know what they don't know. They're not aware. And so they can't be intentional with layering technology, teams, systems, or other types of investments that might actually help their business grow. Yeah, I, I think that there's some important points there. And we, we see it all the time. And Landon and I actually had a meeting on Friday morning in Las Vegas where we met with some clients and, and talked about some of the issues that you just talked about. Right. And what do you do? What do you need to do next in order to scale this business? Because we're kind of at a ceiling with what you guys have today. And so how do we take it to that next level and, and understanding that there's some investment that has to go into this, you have to yep. be able to, to let some things go, you know, and, and, and really one of the terms that Landon and I use an awful lot is that eventually before we get ready to sell this business, this business needs to be running without you. You need to be yep. truly operationally irrelevant, right? And that makes your business worth a whole heck of a lot more. But like you said, a lot of business owners, if not all business owners are control freaks. We wanna do things our way. We think we're the only ones that can do it the way that it needs to be done, right? I mean, I think what you do for a living now is, is a little bit different, right? I mean, you can train coaches to do what you do, but the reality is, like you said, the talents and the abilities that you have only Brian has that level, yeah. right? There's only one Simon Sinek. There's only one Brian. That's, Bowen, exact, that's right? exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. So, you know, in, in that industry, it's a little tougher, right? But in for the actual running of the business, you're absolutely right. 90% or more can be done by other people. And if we can figure out the processes to do that, the business will be worth more yeah. and it'll grow considerably quicker. Well, and I mean, even in my business, just to use my own personal example, again, I just left 100% full time. I've had nine months in this 100% dedicated. But here's the thing. I have a content strategist who does video editing and distribution. I have a graphic design team that helps with different types of things. I have copywriters to help with different elements of what we're looking at. I have content creators that actually help with course development and thought process for some of the different learning tools that we have. I have an admin that helps with scheduling and communications on a whole bunch of different teams. I mean, I've got a team of roughly nine people that we've already scaled over that period of time because the stuff that I can do is the stuff that moves the needle in terms of a revenue standpoint, but the execution for 90% of it isn't needed for me. Now, yep. my, my highest level one-to-one -one clients, I'm still deeply engaged with because to your point, I can train other coaches from a group coaching capacity or for some lower level engagements, but what people are paying me for, there's certain things I can't teach. Because yeah. it's my ability to actually trust my intuition, have my emotional intelligence and have the knowledge and wisdom that's up here from all of my experiences that allows me to see people sometimes more clearly than they see themselves, which yeah. allows me to do that. I can't teach that, but I can structure systems below me so that we can reach scale because one of the biggest things in this business, but it's true in a lot of businesses, is people can end up being a solopreneur forever, right? And yeah. you can end up getting caught in the trap of trading time for money instead of focusing on what are the other monetization strategies and where and how do we round out this business so that we're establishing a business and I'm not just an independent consultant. I'm building a human behavior and performance business. I'm not just a paid by the hour coach. It's one of the things I do, but that's not the holistic business. And that's yeah. the other thing. So for small businesses in general, I used my personal example because I want people to understand like, I don't care what business you're in, if it's products, if it's service, if it's, it doesn't matter. You need to be thinking this way. Like, where are the ways that I can get myself out of the stuff that I don't need to be focused on? Because you are a business owner because you are not risk averse 
and you're a business owner because you have the vision and courage and risk tolerance to be able to go do this. Free yourself up to grow the business because that's what you as a business owner can do better than anybody else. Yep. No doubt about it. So I'm going to ask you this question because you obviously just did it, right? You talked specifically, oops, should turn my own phone off while I'm recording a podcast, but um, you just did it in, in the midst of a pandemic, right? You said that you fully launched 100% in this May of 2020, which, you know, most people are thinking May of 2020, that's two minutes after the world fell apart, or sorry, two months after the world fell apart and you decided to launch a new organization where you're going to go out and, and coach business owners. So, yeah. you know, what, what can business owners do today to scale their businesses into the future? Yeah, so I think that we have an opportunity right now, and I don't know how long it's going to last, that we've never had, which is you can get to more high-powered, talented people than you've ever been able to get to. There's less friction that exists in getting to people, decision makers, than ever has existed. And think about it. The reason I say less friction, let's say in my old world, right, I worked primarily with CFOs and business owners, right? We were working with upper middle market firms in that world. What do we do? Hey, let's get together for a meeting. Let's get together for coffee. Let's get together for a lunch. And what they're thinking on the other side is, is okay, this guy's certainly going to try to sell me something, which that wasn't how I approached stuff, but that's how my industry conditioned them to be, right? Mm -hmm. And they're also looking at, oh, God, I have a lot on my plate. And so if I go get a coffee with this guy, even if it's a coffee and we're not committing to something, that's a minimum of a 45 minute meeting. And depending on what part of town I'm in, it's 30 minutes of commute each direction. It's a two hour commitment all said and done. Yep. Now, what's the risk in taking a 25 minute Zoom call? If I get in 15 minutes and I have a call come up, which I can easily fabricate and fake if I really need to, that's not how I am. But as a business owner, that's how they're thinking. I could get out of this if there's nothing here, right? But what's the risk of a 20 to 25 minute meeting? Because I might meet somebody new. I might find some new solution. I might have new relationships. I might have a different value or impact play. And so what I, what, why I think this has been a blessing in my business is it changed the traditional stage route, right? We talked earlier, I've been on 150 podcasts in the last six months. Part of the reason I went so deep on that strategy is because I started to realize that what used to be described as a global economy wasn't really, but it is now. I've been on podcasts all over the world and I just had a call this morning with somebody who was in Kuwait that they learned about me because of a, a podcast I was on based in Dubai. And we're talking about consultation and coaching services and a guy who's in Kuwait who would have never known or understood who I was otherwise, right? Right. And what that's led to is also a lot of hyper networking, where as a result of the folks that I've actually connected with, I'm going deep and I, my days right now are packed because I'm trying to leverage the opportunity that's in front of us with back-to-back -back 20 to 25 minute meetings to really get to know a whole lot of people in a whole variety of ways. Yeah. Well, that's what that's also led to for me is we just launched a whole podcast community, which doesn't exist for any one of its kind that is out there. There's a bunch of networks, there's a bunch of different things, but we literally, I have three different powerhouses Two, two guys who've been in the podcast game for a decade and run masterminds for the top 300 podcasters on the planet. And one who his own show last year had over 2 million downloads. And the four of us combined to bring podcasters together to focus on community collaboration and collective impact. It also gives us the ability to plug in their message on a much bigger level. And we're putting a 24 hour radio and TV network on the back end of it. Would that have happened without COVID and me leveraging this opportunity? No. But I think a lot of people are like, well, I can't do business like I used to. Well, I can't go meet people. Really? Why not? You, we're having a conversation. We've never met in person, yeah. right? But I think we've got some synergies. We're probably going to find a way to stay in touch. And Austin, you and I are in the same town. So of course, yeah. we're going to get together once all this passes. Yep. But none of this would have happened if I didn't recognize and leverage like that opportunity. Now, I'll tell you from a tactical standpoint as well, um, as a speaker and a coach, two things that I did, that not everybody has to do, but I think it makes a difference is life is about one, showing up, two, how you show up, and three, where you show up, right? So I always want to show up, but how I show up is also important to me because I have a standard for how I operate. The quality of the image that you see is because I have a literal virtual studio back here. That's a real background, not a green screen. I have a five point light setup. It's seven feet behind me. I've got a high quality DSLR camera that's streaming as my webcam and you're on a 50 inch television. Now, the reason all that took place is two things. One, I wanted to make sure that I showed up as clear, crisp, without hesitation on who I was to anybody that I'm having a conversation with. Sound, light, video quality all matter. And they can see me and absorb me authentically for who I am. The yeah. reason you're on a 50 inch TV was two reasons. 
One, I'm a coach. I read people. I look at micro expressions, emotions, like little triggers. I watch body language. On a, even on a 27 inch iMac, it wasn't translating the same way. But you both look like you're sitting across the table from me and we're having lunch. I can see you in life size form. And so it shortens the curve from virtual world to real world in a way that I can consume you probably not much different than it would be if we were sitting across the table. Yeah. So I think that it's also like, hey, not just do we have an opportunity in front of us as small business owners. I don't care what you sell, what you do, how you're going to grow your business. You can get to decision makers and people who buy your product faster and easier now than you've ever been able to. I guarantee it. And then second, how do you differentiate yourself so that you don't miss some of the communication blocks that can happen virtually so that you can operate as if you're in person, even if you're not as best as possible. And if you do those two things, this is an opportunity time for me. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, I, so we just saw some, some statistics that came out and I, I'm pretty sure it was a conference that Landon and I were on together, but um, some statistics came out that said people in our industry. So the financial planning industry, we, yep. we tend to think that we're unique in the way that we approach it. But if you're looking financial advisors, financial planning, only 20% of financial advisors in 2020 had a better year than they had in 2019. Only 20%, right? And, and the, the, I did, I know that Landon did. And so, but part of that is exactly what you just did. Yeah. Right. And, Part of it is I've got the three screens set up. I do have the green screen because I just changed. changed Which works. I mean, it works. Yeah. But it, it works fine, right? But it will actually step up from here. But what we've found is that we do have the ability to have access to people that we didn't have access to before. We launched our podcast in May, the same way that you launched your pod or your business in May, right? It was like, do we really want to do this? Is now the time to do it? But we, we took that leap and we said, this is the time to do it. And we've seen the benefits already in our businesses. We've seen the opportunity to interact with more business owners. And for the first time in my career, 20 years I've been doing this, for the first time in my career, I have onboarded clients that have gone through the full financial planning process, never met. signed documents. I've never met them in person. First time in 20 years. But I've started two businesses with people I've never met. Two businesses. I have business partners and investment and capital tied up in, in people I've never met. Yeah. Like exact same thing. I mean, that's it, that wouldn't have happened without COVID. I view that as a blessing, not as a negative thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love absolutely. that you guys both grew last year. I mean, because you're leveraging the opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the word pivot gets used too often, but we, we had to pivot you in did. our businesses. And it was either figure out a way to pivot and still move forward or be happy with the way that 2019 was because 2020 is going to be the same or worse. Yep. And so we, we made the, you know, the uh, investments and we made some changes to our businesses and we've been able to reap the, the benefits. And so, you know, I, I think that it is something that all of a sudden it's okay to do business this way. Before yep. it was like, I don't know if I want to be coached by a guy via Zoom or I don't know if I want to, you know, do financial planning via Zoom. I gotta, I gotta sit across the table from the guy so that I can decide if this guy really knows what yeah. he's doing. That's right. That's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have the ability if you put in the investment to really do it the right way to thrive in this, right? My family and I, we bought a, an RV this year. Love it. I spent a lot of time doing this podcast and client meetings from my RV. Right. Yeah. In a few weeks, we will be going to Maui as a family. I will still record the podcast. I will still have client meetings from Maui. Two years ago, I probably wouldn't have tried to do that. Yeah. By the way, I'm, I'm, I have to sidebar on you for the Maui thing because my wife and I were there in December for our 10 year anniversary. We'd yeah. never been to Maui, but we basically had the island to ourselves. Hmm. And the locals told us that the island hasn't been like that since the 50s or 60s. So have you been to Maui before? First time to Maui, we've been to Oahu and Kauai, but it's the first okay. time. Okay, so definitely take advantage of doing the road to Hana while you're there, yep. because what traditionally is just an absolute cluster, way too many cars, not enough places to do it. We spread it out over two days. So we actually stayed in Hana on the black sand beach in a condo that we got for one night, but we broke it up into two days. We might've seen 20 cars over two days. And of all of the 11 hikes that you can go to see all of these wonderful like secluded pools 
and waterfalls, which are typically packed trails, we saw maybe 10 people. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's gorgeous. So I, I had to sidebar there because you're going at a beautiful time. And if yeah. you take advantage of it, same thing with the volcano. I mean, if you go up to the summit for the sunrise, typically that's packed. We saw two vehicles the entire day that we were there and did the hike. So you're going at a time that's going to be absolutely amazing. Sorry, I had, yeah. I had to go there because we, we just had a magical experience and I know you will too. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're excited. So uh, looking forward to it. Landon, I did it again. I just kept going and going and going. So I'm going to let you close out the show with any question you want to ask Brian at the well, end. He, at least he respects his elders, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Sit, listen, son, sit back and let dad teach you how to do this. Oh man, man. Um, no, this has been, this has been, uh, awesome. I'm just sitting here like a sponge, just soaking it, soaking it in, you know, and it's, it's a lot of fun, Brian, you know, Austin and I are good friends and we're, we're partners and we spend a tremendous amount of time, you know, serving our clients together. And, and I still learn stuff about them all the time on the podcast. So it's, it's, it's all good. But, um, yeah, as we kind of push up against time, uh, Brian, um, man, we've, we've identified some great things here. And uh, speaking of identifying, um, when, a, when a business owner, you know, we've talked a little bit about hurdles. We've talked a little bit about scaling. You've made some great points and some suggestions and shared some, some really thoughtful uh, things with us. Uh, let's talk just a minute about... Um, you know, how do, how do business owners, how do they, how do they sit down and identify some of their own strengths and weaknesses? I know you've talked about, you know, self-awareness, but uh, before you can kind of, uh, you know, be self-aware, how do, how do you sit down and, and, and do that? How do you figure out what your own strengths and weaknesses are so that you can uh, be cognizant of what they are and then you know, create a path to, to move forward for more success. Yeah. So I, I think the fastest and easiest way, but it requires a little bit of vulnerability is to ask people that are around you, ask clients, ask business partners, ask spouses, ask friends. Um, if you, if you have no idea where to start, that's the first place because that'll give you some ways to unpack. Now there's some people who might already know it for themselves in some ways. And I, I'm going to not approach that because I think one of the most Powerful ways is to gain perspective. Perspective points us to what's important. So if you were to go sit down with your top clients, people that you've worked with in the past, coworkers, associates that work for you now, your business partners, and you simply ask, what do you think I'm really good at? Where do you think I struggle? What are areas of opportunity for growth? Just ask open-ended questions. Another question that I think is phenomenal is asking somebody, hey, if you could take one gift or one skill set that I have and plug it into your own life, what would that be? Because often people look at you and admire you for something that you might not even realize they admire you for. That question really helps them understand with you understand with clarity, hey, this is one of the gifts that people often identify. Now, most of the time when this happens, if you show up relatively consistently in your life, that is, you're probably going to start to notice some themes if you ask enough people, right? You don't have to ask 500 people. You could probably ask five to 10 and get a lot of clarity around some places to start to unpack and better understand. The other side of that is once you've asked those questions or even before, if you desire to just simply look at what are the things I've done in the past that have made me successful? What are some behaviors and traits that I have used, whether it be consistency, whether it be discipline, whether it be uh, not, not shy to pick up the phone and have a conversation, whether it be using strategy and tactics in the way that your brain works to map out solutions for clients in a unique and different way. Do you leverage relationship or do you leverage right actual technical skills? I think we all have a little bit of awareness to be able to answer some of those questions ourselves. And those are the things that I would say, double down on. If those are your gifts, if those are your strengths, if that's what's made you successful, how do you continue to compound on that? Uh, another place, if you have no idea where to begin, uh, I'm a big fan of the book, Strength Finders 2.0. The whole concept there is let's not fix our deficiencies, let's focus on our strengths. And I think that the evaluation there gives a really good understanding of who you are and how you show up as a business leader and in the world. Uh, so that's a great place. So hopefully those three things or combination of them will help individuals get some clarity there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to, I want to get pull extract uh, one last little nugget out of you before we wrap up, which I, I think is really important. We've talked about 
uh, intentionality and being authentic, but can you relate that to why is that important for business owners when it comes to their own staff and employees and how can that help propel them to get to where they want to go? Yeah, so that's huge. Uh, I mean, what, what we know is that leaders who see themselves as their associates see them and who have a high level of awareness typically have associates that work harder for them, produce better results. They have better relationships, better level to have communication. This has been studied. Um, and so that's the simplistic answer. But the reality of it is, is we also don't want to show up as business leaders just simply for the sake of business. Maybe some do. But most also recognize and realize that a lot of business is leveraging relationships. It's about building relationships. It's about human connection. And that's what a lot of us desire. So I don't care what business you're in, if it's a tech business that's pushing product, or if you're truly in a service-based business, everything involves people. So having a high level of self-awareness not only helps you better map and understand the way to lead within your organization, how to build quality relationships with your associates, but when you operate from that standpoint and you understand where they're coming from as well, Associates will run through walls for leaders who are self-aware and who have an element of empathy and understanding in the way that they build relationships. It's a fact, right? You could have two business partners that operate in the exact same entity. One that treats people poorly, who doesn't have a good level of self-awareness, who's constantly micromanaging, who's in those positions. And then the other who has a high level of self-awareness, who gives his team autonomy, who empowers them to have opportunity and growth, who teaches along the way, who gets out of their way and lets them shine within clients' fronts. Who do you think they're going to work harder for? That comes down to self-awareness. If you want the highest amount of output from your teams, it's not a manipulation thing. It's a relationship play. It just so happens that you have better relationships and your teams will run through walls for you a lot more consistently than if you don't have a strong connection with them. Hopefully that answers your question, brother. Yeah, no, that's great, man. That's yeah, it does. Absolutely. Well, Brian, this has been uh an absolute uh, gift and a, and a pleasure to uh, have you on. And uh, we're thankful that you carved out the time to be with us and uh, share with us real quick, Brian, uh, how, what, what's the best way for people to uh, track you down if they want to have a conversation with you? Yeah. So brianbogert.com is going to be one of the best places because all our social media channels are in there. A lot of our publications that have been in Forbes and others are in there. Um, and to impact a billion lives, I'm intimately aware that 99.9999999% will never pay me a dollar. And I'm very okay with that. So we create a lot of free content um, and it's all housed there. Uh, we also have a free resource for folks that's, uh, if, if folks want to go down that path, go to nolimitsprelude.com. It's a succinct download of a lot of our core coaching philosophies. Clearly it's, it's scaled down, but it's the right questions to ask yourself to take yourself on that intrinsic journey, get a little bit more clarity on who you are and the types of things that you will then ultimately need to do to get yourself moving forward. Um, so that downloads absolutely free. Uh, feel free to go visit that as well if you'd like. So say that one again, because it broke up a little bit when you said it, I didn't quite catch the website address. It's nolimitsprelude.com. There we go. Okay, cool. Well, I, I really have appreciated the conversation. I think you're absolutely right that we will meet face-to-face -face when, uh, when this is all over, but there's definitely reasons for us to stay in touch. We appreciate the insights. I do want to mention real quick that we have important partners of the program, Fintrepid Solutions and GBS Benefits. We couldn't do this program without them. Um, but we, you know, the, Landon and I really enjoy doing this program and highlighting small businesses and their owners, their founders, and those who serve small businesses. And, and you fit both of those uh, criteria. And so we really appreciate you being on the program and look forward to staying in touch with you as time goes on. Likewise. Well, thank you for building a platform to put good into the world and help people. That's the only reason we've got the opportunity to meet. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. <laughs>